deeds. Any questions or anything before we get started? Okay, we're good to go. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. If I can call this meeting to order uh, and ask you all to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Selectman McCarnell, if you would lead us in the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First up on our agenda, item number three is recognition and recognition for National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. We've got a bit of a proclamation to read here. From the town of Fairfield, the town of Fairfield proudly celebrates January 9th, 2016 as National Law Appreciation or National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. On January 9th, partnering with organizations in support of law enforcement officers nationwide, we will promote National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. It is important for every community to show all individuals working in law enforcement that their public service is appreciated. Whereas on January 9th, the citizens of, and Fairfield community are encouraged to support law enforcement in a number of ways that may include sending a card or email of support to the local police department or state agency, sharing a story about a positive law enforcement experience on social media, asking children or adults in the community to write letters in support of law enforcement, and most importantly, if you see a police officer, please thank him or her. And whereas the town of Fairfield wishes to publicly recognize and appreciate the dedication, hard work, and bravery that the men and women in our police department have demonstrated throughout the years, and whereas law enforcement in Fairfield was first organized in the year 1661, Chief, with the appointment of the first town marshal, the Fairfield Police Department has established by a town ordinance in 1930 with seven officers working as poli at police headquarters on the Post Road. You guys have moved a long way since then. <laughs> The original seven-man department has evolved into a fully operational department with over 100 sworn officers, as well as authorized special police officers, animal control officers, marina guards, and the support services bureau that includes administrative units and the emergency communication center. The department is organized into several divisions or bureaus, each performing separate and vital functions within the department. Whereas Fairfield's law enforcement serves our town faithfully, night and day, knowing they may face extremely dangerous situations while carrying out their duties. And whereas on National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day and every day throughout the year, the Fairfield community is encouraged to support and thank all those who serve on the front lines and behind the scenes at Fairfield's Police Department, which goes above and beyond in making our community a safe place. Now therefore, I, Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the town of Fairfield, do hereby proclaim January 6, 2016 is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day throughout the town of Fairfield. Congratulations, Chief. <laughs> and would you like to come up to the podium and say a few words? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. First of all, thank you uh, so much for the, the recognition. Just as a little historical fact, you know, oftentimes when we start thinking public safety, we look globally because uh, the national attention focused on public safety is, is always of a global nature. What we always encourage this community to do is to look locally. And that local look really is the one-on-one -on -one contacts that you have with the men and women of the Fairfield Police Department, our dispatchers, our civilian staff, our animal control officers, all those in, in the police department that have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. I think as a result of some of the national dialogue, uh, people on a national level began to look to say, how do we take a day, although I think it should be 365 days, uh, to recognize and, and acknowledge the work that the officers do. We cannot do the work that we do without the, the community support. 
Uh, we have over 44,000 calls for service this year. That's what we respond to. The interactions are too numerous to account for. I do on a local level want to recognize uh, Dr. and Mr. Poster on a local level who have always been very strong supporters of the Fairfield Police Department and have really brought this national recognition to you and to the to the town so I appreciate all of their efforts uh, just on a, on a side note the men and women it's not even on a side note the men and women of the Fairfield Police Department 24 hours a day are out there we uh, spend a lot of time preparing for those things that we hope never happen but we certainly are out there preparing. It is not without its risks. And on a day that we acknowledge the work they do, I think it's really important that we just take a moment of silence for two officers <coughs> who, serving the community of Fairfield, lost their lives in the line of duty. One would be Special Officer Kavanaugh, who lost his life in the line of duty. And uh, the other would be Sheriff Pike, who many, many, many years ago uh, was killed while trying to apprehend a suspect at the still Fairfield Main Railroad Station. So both of those officers are listed on the Law Enforcement Memorial in Washington, D.C., but I think if we could all just take a moment of silence to recognize all their sacrifice. With that, thank you very much for this recognition. The way you said, I did, uh, as much as I, I did reference the chief, I do want to point out there are several members of the police department here as well as several members of the uh, police commission. I want to thank you all for showing up to share in this appreciation. Um, Lori or Chris, did you want to add any comments? I'd just like to say thank you for yeah. your service to you and to the commissioners and to the assistant chiefs. Yeah. I appreciate everything. I'll second Lori's comment. Thank you. I know you guys are out there 24 hours a day uh, working extremely hard to protect the citizens of Fairfield. So thank you for that. And this recognition should be 365 days a year, not just one. Yeah, and uh, I would be remiss if I just didn't add the fact that I couldn't do the job that I do without the 108 other people in the department that really do the, the hard work here. So I appreciate them just as much as you all do too. So thank you again for the recognition. All right, guys, why don't we step out and present this officially to the chief. Can we get all everybody in the picture? Next up, we have some special recognition from the Connecticut State Golf Association naming H. Smith Richardson the 2015 Club of the Year. Ms. Lombardo, would you like to come up and tell us more about that? Well, we'd like to uh, thank you for recognizing us as well. Um, the Connecticut Golf Association is the governing body of uh, the state of Connecticut golf uh, courses and uh, it was presented to us uh, this past month and we are very extremely proud of getting it we are the first municipal <laughs> golf course in the state to be recognized as the distinguished golf course of the year um, we are recognized for the, the uh, programs that we put on the clubs that we, uh, supporting all the clubs that use our facility, as well as the condition of our facility. Um, this goes to say we get the support 
from the bodies, the town bodies, our golf commission, uh, with the funding that you have supported for the finance our TM. And without that, we wouldn't be getting this award because the CSGA does not go and play courses that are not in good shape. And the reason they're in good shape is the funding, but also because of the staff that we have. Uh, Peter Grace is here, our superintendent, and his people that um, maintain it, and Jim Alexander, our golf professional, who, and his staff who oversee the management of the facility. Without them and without the support of the community, um, we would not have received this distinguished award um, that we are going to promote and hopefully get more play than the 43,000 rounds that we did previously did this year. Um, but I think it's a tribute to this whole community um, of the support that we get for the golf course. And I want to thank you as well as uh, the staff uh, for recognizing us. And the staff has some real challenges, if I understand it. 43,000 to 44,000 rounds a year uh, is considerably higher. 40, 46 complimentary rounds. Does that yes. count Christmas Eve this year? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm only when I say 43 rounds, 43,000. Those are only paid rounds. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> uh, that's all. I can so say. that's that's as I understand it, that's more than a normal course yes. would endure. And second, it's open seven days a week. We're open seven so days a week, and we're open till January third, right? January third this year. So many golf courses, I believe, in the state shut down one day a week or some time. <clears throat> so we basically have the course in action. Uh, more than most other courses and have more rounds going on. So that makes the job that you all are doing is, is even more difficult to kind of keep everything up to snuff and doing that. So again, congratulations and thank you very much for that. And if I may, just to give the, uh, you, a rec you know, an idea of what the clubs we're up against that, that have received it in the past, New Haven Country Club, Brooklawn Country Club, uh, Weatherfield Country Club, Hartford Country Club, these are all distinguished and well um, deserved clubs and big time uh, private facilities. And like I said, we are the first municipal golf course to get one. That's, uh, that's huge. Okay. Chris Laurie, any final comments? Uh, congratulations. I didn't get a chance to play the course this year, but I have played it many, many times in my life. I grew up playing Smith Richardson Golf Course. Uh, I love the nine holes after school, and uh, it's something I hope my kids can go ahead and, and do. Uh, and I just started to teach my seven-year-old golf, actually this winter, believe it or not. Uh, so I'm excited that we're getting this recognition. I think it's long overdue because I think out of the public courses I've played across the state, Smith Richardson has always, in my mind, been one of the underrated courses uh, in the town. So uh, I applaud this recognition today. It's, it's well deserved. Right. Yeah, I mean, I've been playing up there for a long time. We used to play um, after school when I was teaching. We'd go up there and play nine holes. Um, we actually just played in December this year, which is the first time I've ever played golf in December here. <laughs> of course, was still in great shape. And um, every time I play it, I think it's, I remember how beautiful it is. You get to that back nine and some of those holes. Um, so it, it's great and it's terrific that we received this uh, recognition. Thank you. Jerry, I, I do have my, my annual question that if we approve less money for the course, could you make the bunkers smaller? <laughs> <laughs> what about that hill on six? Good idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've got uh, a certificate to present to you, Jerry, okay. so if we could. Peter. Jim. Wow. That's a serious. We'll display this nicely up there also. In between you two. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm right here. Yeah. Yeah. So, maybe a little bit closer. Thank you. Thanks for the Congratulations. <laughs> All right, next up.
we have the minutes to consider and act upon the minutes of the regular meeting from December 16th, 2015. May I have a motion to accept? I will make the motion. A second? I'll second. All right. Um, any comments or changes to the minutes? No. We're ready to vote? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up, we have some reappointments to the to hear and consider and act upon the following appointments. Uh, first item for the Affordable Housing Commission, Mr. Robert Frigo, U, thirty nine uh, unaffiliated rather, thirty nine Campbell Road for a term of eleven fifteen to eleven nineteen. May I have a motion to accept? Make a motion. A second. I'll second it. Right. Any further comments on Mr. Frigo? No. I don't see Mr. Frigo. Is he here? I don't think he's here. Okay. Uh, any uh, no further comments from the board? Any comments from the public? All right. Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations, Mr. Frigo. All right. Next up. Also for the Affordable Housing Commission, Jill Horace Neak, a Democrat from 6 Brooklawn Parkway for a term of 1115 to 1119. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. Uh, second? Right here. All right. Any further discussion? No, I just appreciate her coming back. Is Jill here? Forward. Yeah. Oh, there we are. All right, good. Yeah. Appreciate oh, yeah. your service and that you're willing to continue. Right. And I've heard good things coming out of the board. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and just obviously through the last year, uh, we went through the or last couple of years, we went through the update of the affordable housing plan. Uh, we also were challenged by uh, some um, legal entanglements we got involved in with respect to affordable housing in town. Uh, had a long discussion with HUD uh, about that, and they were impressed with. Uh, the plan we put in place and the steps we took and we've had follow-up meetings with them so your, your board has done well from that standpoint for thank you for, for serving us any further thank comments you. any comments from the public uh, back to the board are we ready to vote yes all in favor aye, aye. Thank you. Uh, next up for the board of health uh, denise walsh democrat uh, 2017 North Road, term of 1115 to 1119. I have a motion to accept. I'll make a motion. A second. I'll second. All right. Uh, is Denise here? There we are. Good. All right. Uh, any comments from the board? Well, I would just say that I um, appreciate, again, making the commitment to re up and do this again and um, bring a lot to the table when I look at what you've done. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And same here, it, it uh, volunteers, and especially um, the Board of Health. I mean, as much as we don't hear about that all the time, if you go back over the last two years, uh, and, and it kind of went away, so it's kind of out of sight and out of mind, but the Board of Health was on um, some significant red alerts when we went through the whole Ebola crisis. Uh, and as much as that uh, didn't have a major role here in town, it was something that we had to prep for, make prep preparations for uh, and that wasn't uh, if you remember what was happening in other communities at the time that got to be a little controversial at times so I want to thank you for your part in helping guide us through all of that any further comments from the board Is that any comments from the public back to the board we're ready to vote yes all in favor Aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. next up uh, for the police commission, uh, I'm nominating uh, Mr. Walter Flynn, and I know we haven't had a chance to talk in detail, and I know there are some uh, questions and, and some other considerations on this, but I did want to uh, nominate Mr. Flynn as a longtime public servant, as somebody who served the police commission most recently as chair. Uh, he's also had past service on the Board of Finance uh, 
and that has served him well on the commission. He served as one of the three Democrats on the well-balanced seven-member commission for the last four years. There have been three Democrats, three Republicans, and one unaffiliated. The commission has done an excellent job uh, through Storm Irene, Storm Sandy, in support of Sandy Hook, the Storm Nemo, the Metro North train crash, and the recent school lockdown, and many other events. And for all these reasons, I believe Mr. Flynn is deserving of another term. So I'm making that motion. Is there a second? Okay, seeing none, that motion fails. We move on to the next one. Uh, next one, item seven, is uh, for the parking authority. This is a first selectman appointment for information only. Uh, this is Lynn Farrell, unaffiliated from 801 South Pine Creek Road for a term of 1115 to 1120. And this is to fill a vacancy for Mary Kay Frost, whose term expired. Uh, next up is to hear, consider, and act upon the following appointments. In this case, the Fire Commission. And I'm placing a nomination, Eric Calper. And I realize that uh, we also haven't had a chance to talk on this. And I know there was some uh, concern and uh, options discussed. So let me, um, in nominating Eric, who is a member of the Working Families Party, which is neither Democrat or Republican, he does currently serve as a Fairfield firefighter. It's been a few years since we had an active firefighter on the commission, and I'm proposing Eric to ha add balance. One of the alternatives that was proposed uh, was to add a member of the Stratfield Volunteers, since we already have a representative from the Southport Volunteers on the Commission, adding a number, another member of the Volunteers would in essence provide 30% of the seven-member board as volunteer representative, representatives with no career representation. I thought it would be best to provide some balance, and that's why I was proposing Eric provide that. So I'll make the motion uh, for us to consider Eric. Is there a second? there's no second, then that motion fails. I'd like to be a motion, if I can. No. Uh, do you want to do it now or under new business? I'd like to do it now, if I can. Go right ahead. Sure. I'd like to make a motion to nominate Joe Ozaki of 476 South Pine Creek Road. Um, Joe has been a long active member uh, of the Fairfield community. Uh, I met with several people about serving on the fire commission and Joe is the one who stuck out in my mind most of all. Uh, he will bring an awful lot to the board. Uh, I look forward to the contributions he's going to make. Uh, this is a 10-month appointment. We will be having this discussion again in uh, November. So uh, my anticipation is that uh, through this 10-month period, we'll find out all the great contributions Joe makes to the board, and we'll see where <coughs> the fire department stands uh, in November. So I nominate Joe Ozaki to be on the fire commission. Is there a second? I'll second that. Uh, any further discussion? No. All right. Any comments from the public? All right. Saying none, back to the board. Um, I still have my same concern about the balance on the commission and the amount of representation from the uh, volunteer departments. Uh, so it, it uh, while I agree that Mr. Osaki um, is certainly um, a good person, and I don't mean any of this personally, but just from a structural standpoint, I have difficulty with that percentage of volunteer representation on the seven-member uh, fire commission. However, any further comments or discussion? No, I, I recognize your concern, and we will uh, watch it. Uh, I believe that Joe will serve uh, outstanding as he's done for the town of Fairfield and will represent represent us very well so um, I fully support that 
Any further comments? Nope. All right. Uh, shall we vote? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes, and Mr. Ozaki is the new member of the fire commission. Next item up, also for the Fire Commission, is Mr. Francis O'Reilly, Republican from 869 Valley Road, for a term of 1115 to 1120. And this is to fill a vacancy for Tom Christie, whose term expired. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. Uh, any discussion? I think Frank is also an outstanding member. He's going to be a great addition to the Fire Commission. Uh, I look forward to hearing about his contributions to the Commission moving forward. Uh, it's one of those guys who I'm really happy we got involved in town government, and uh, this is a really good nomination. Good. Any further comments? No. Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving on to the Harbor Management Commission. Uh, and this also requires RTM approval. Uh, first is Christopher Jennings, Republican, from 25 Sherwood Place for a term of 1115 to 1119 to fill a vacancy for Nelson North, whose term expired. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make the motion. A second? I'll second it. Any discussion? Is Mr. Jennings here? <coughs> okay. Um, any comments from the public? Back to the board. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, next up, Kim Taylor, also to the Harbor Management Commission, a Democrat from 44 Craig Place for a term of 1115 to 1119 to fill a vacancy for Hughes Smith, whose term expired. May I have a motion to accept? I'll do that. I'll second it. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Yep. Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, next up for the Land Acquisition Commission, uh, Jeffrey Caldenzi, Democrat from 118 Green Knowles Lane for a term of November 15 to November 19. This is to fill a vacancy for Jean Harrison, whose term expired. May I have a motion to accept? I'll make the motion. A second. I'll second it. Uh, is Mr. Galdenzi here? I am. All right. Very good. Thank you for coming today. Uh, any questions or discussion? I'd just like to say you have big shoes to fill. <laughs> Jean has been uh, an outstanding member of the community for a very long time. Since I was a little kid, I remember Jean. Uh, and uh, I hope you're up for the task. And thank you, Gene, for your years of service on that committee. Mike, you might want to know Kim Taylor is here. Oh, I'm sorry. Kim, are you? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. The, um, and thank you and congratulations on your appointment also. Um, Mr. Gondansi, also thank you. Land, land acquisition is, is an, uh, quite a challenge in this economic climate and when Fairfield is as built up mm -hmm. as it is. So I would encourage you to be a little creative is how you approach that. I've had some talks with the chair, Mr. Widmer, and um, I'm very impressed with the approach he's taking, and I hope you can support him in doing that. And again, um, right, back to the board. Any um, more discussion? No, just thank Third you. Yeah. All, right. All in favor? No, I, Aye. Aye. Congratulations, Mr. Widmer. And congratulations, Ms. Taylor, if we didn't say that earlier. Thank you very much. And Paige, thank you for pointing that out. Um, next up, the Parks and Rec Commission. Uh, first, Gregory Alprin, Democrat, 130 Lee Drive, for a term of 1111 through 1116. This is to fill a vacancy for Patty Dyer, who resigned. May I have a motion to accept? Uh, hold on. I was told that the term was going to expire at the end of this year in our pre meeting, not 1116. Well, 1116. Yeah, that is 1116. Is oh, jeez. Gosh. <laughs> I apologize. Happy New Year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was looking at two. I, I, okay. 
I got you. Uh, any, now, we had a motion to accept or not? Uh, yeah. A I'm second? Ready. I'll second it. Okay. Any further discussion? No. Is Greg here? Greg, are you out there? The rooms are not always this crowded, guys, so we have to look around for all of this. Um, so any comments from the public? All right, then back to this board. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, next up, also for the Parks and Recreation Commission, Christopher McCoy, Republican, 26 Barlow Plain Drive, for a term of 1115 through 1120. And this is to fill a vacancy for Robert Syrup, whose term expired. Uh, may I have a motion to accept? I'll make a motion. A second? I'll second it. Is Mr. McCoy here? No. All right. uh, any discussion on behalf of the board? No. I think Chris could be an outstanding member of the board. I look forward to his contributions. <laughs> the, uh, I enjoyed my conversation with Mr. McCoy, and I was very impressed with what he would bring to the board. So. He's very excited to, to be on this board. Okay. Uh, Ready to vote? Yes. Yeah. All in favor? Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Town Plan and Zoning Commission. Uh, Daniel C. Ford, Republican, 1106 Valley Road for term 1113 to 1117. This is an alternate, and this is to fill a vacancy created by Meg Francis and her election as a full member uh, during the recent uh, elections. So I may have a motion to accept. I'll make a motion. A second. I'll second it. Any conversation? Uh, I know Dan's excited to serve on this board as well, so I'm happy for appointing. Yep. Okay. Good. Definitely uh, a member of a long-term family here in town, uh, and uh, it's great to see him get involved and help out in this capacity. Any comments from the public? Back to the board. Ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? I'd like to make it a, an add-on to this, if I can. A uh, motion to add the police commission appointment on there Okay. to fill a vacancy. Uh, I'd like to point Joe Caffarelli of 129 College Place. Uh, Joe is a member of the, the beach area, and uh, I look forward to his contributions on the, the police commission moving forward. I know he has been actively attending police commission meetings for a while. Uh, he's eager to serve on this board. Uh, and I think he's going to represent uh, the town of Fairfield very well on the police commission. Okay. I think we may have not quite done this right last time, but let's do it right this time. Let's get a motion to add that to the agenda. So you make okay. a motion to add that to the agenda. I'm making a motion. I'll second it. it. I'll second it. <laughs> so now we need a motion to place his name in consideration. I'd like to make a motion to place Joe Caffarelli, 129 College Place okay. Road. For the police commission. All right, and I'll a second, second it. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Do we have any of the? We don't have the backup here, but I believe Mr. Caffarelli did turn in a questionnaire he has earlier that we three of us had copies yeah. of. He's here. We can ask him. Okay. The um, I guess two things. One, I'm um, obviously still disappointed that that Mr. Flynn wasn't um, appointed, but we've moved on from that. I think one of the important things on the police commission is balance, um, and I think that. Um, for the last four years, we've done that with uh, three Democrats, uh, one unaffiliated, and three Republicans. And at the moment, we have four Republicans on the board. I am a little concerned with uh, Mr. Caffarelli's, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, history as an unaffiliate. It's my understanding he changed his registration uh, just a few weeks back uh, to from Republican to R and that would effectively limit the Democrats to two seats on that board 
I think that our town charter has a provision for maximum representation of just over uh, a majority, or a bare majority, I think it's described as. I think this effectively makes it five R's and two D's. I think the police commission is extremely important uh, because of its role in our town. And I think our charter was set up to provide better balance than that uh, in what we have here. So I would be very concerned. And the lateness of the switch, doing it just a few weeks ago, provides the appearance regardless of intent, of circumventing our charter. And I think that's a dangerous precedent to set. In the four years that uh, I have served, or just over four years, that kind of late switch hasn't happened. Uh, and in fact, over four years, this board, uh, when you look at all the appointments that it made, appointed 118 Democrats, one independent, 130 Republicans, um, and 93 unaffiliated. So a pretty good balance of people being appointed across all boards and all commissions. And certainly setting up a board that would effectively be five Republicans and two Democrats uh, is a cause for concern. If I may rebut that, um, I'd like to uh, point out that there are commissions in the town which have uh, an uneven number of views. Uh, I've also looked into this. I am aware of the current structure. I know that Mr. Caffarelli will serve with uh, dignity and honor to the police commission. He is uh, a fantastic nomination. Uh, I fully support this. And I don't believe politics will come into play at all on the police commission moving forward. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, as you point out, there are various numbers of use at different boards. Uh, I think it's the timing of this uh, that is a concern. I think it's the fact that it's, it's uh, limiting the democratic representation, which is what the town charter is set up to protect in terms of provide that balance and uh, also have concerns as to whether uh, because of the lateness of the change, whether it meets the state statutes which were set up to protect uh, this balance and uh, loading up the boards at the last minute. And as I understand from the state statute, that it's got to wait uh, a longer period than the time from 11:19 to now. So that would make the um, nominee, uh, again, without any regard to the person himself, but would make his qualifications um, not eligible to be appointed at this time. I, Mr. Caffarelli is a registered, unaffiliated uh, voter here in town. And uh, I know that the town, town charter is set up uh, for this very reason. Uh, his eligibility should not be in question today. Uh, for whatever reasons, Mr. Caffarelli switched his party nomination. Uh, I believe there's going to be a lot of people this year switching their party nomination um, because of the presidential year. Uh, regardless of uh, the reason, Currently, Mr. Gaffarelli is a registered, unaffiliated voter and is before us in good standing. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lester, as town attorney. Mr. Caffarelli will be eligible to be appointed, but first selectman is correct. There's a state statute which says that if you switch political parties or you become unaffiliated, that you cannot be appointed to a border commission of a political nature within for three months from that the date of that. So his appointment today would not be legal in my opinion. You're gonna to have to wait probably till next month, but section nine dash fifty nine does mandate that you wait three months from either switching your party affiliation or uh, going off a of party's roles. Can I see a copy of the statute, please? Sure.
It just means you're going to have to wait. Careful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can read the pertinent part because it's kind of buried in this thing. So I, I'm reading here, and I, I I seem to remember there was a, there's a, a 10 day party switch. No, it's what it says is any elector who has applied for erasure of his name from an enrollment list shall not be entitled to be appointed as a member of any board or commission that is political in nature for a period of three months from the date of the filing of his application for transfer or for erasure. And that's kind of paraphrased. I've taken out a lot of things that don't apply there. But that's what it says. Um, and what he did was he did apply for erasure, which means you have your name removed from that, from the list of a political party and, and become unaffiliated. So he can be appointed, but I think you're just going to have to wait a little bit. That's all. So that from, um, it's 90 days, you said? It's three months, not 90 days. So I would, I would say that if it- December 19th, to November 19th, to December 19th, to January 19th, to February 19th. So that would any be time after day. February Yeah, 19th. so a meeting in February would be eligible. Given that, then a vote on that motion is inappropriate at this time. Excuse me, the board is up here. Thank you. So moving on to excellent item nine. The Oaklawn Cemetery Association, a report from the Oaklawn Cemetery Association on the 105th anniversary and donation to maintain and preserve the town's historic cemeteries. <coughs> the Oakland Association, yes. Please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm a little uh, bit about about your um, President Board of Directors of the Oakland Cemetery Association. Very pleased to be here, and I appreciate having a couple of moments to talk about Oak Lawn and hopefully lighten things up a little bit. Um, most of you probably are familiar with Oak Lawn, located at the bottom of Greenfield Hill. We have 100 acres. A lot of people don't know how big we are, but there are 100 acres. About 50 are being used for cemetery purposes. The rest are nature preserves, wetlands, and woodlands. And we're looking forward to developing them in the future, both for the public and for burial use in a very, very environmentally conscientious way. I'd like to also talk about a few things we're doing now. In the last few years, we're doing things to create a more park-like environment at Oak Lawn. We uh, recently dedicated a veterans memorial about a year ago. The first selectman was there. We appreciated it very much. It's right at the entrance to the grounds. It's to get dedicated to all the veterans in the area and nationally. Uh, we have over 1,200 veterans interred at Oak Lawn, a lot of Civil War veterans, and uh, a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Um, we're trying to stretch out and get more involved with the community, so we are doing something right now in conjunction with the Fairfield History Center and museum and with the Garden Club of Fairfield, we have a apiary, which I didn't even know what it was until recently. Beeha, we have a collection of beehives, six hives near the entrance. We produce honey, which we distribute. Two years ago, we had uh, 300 jars of honey distributed through Oak Lawn, also through the History Center and through the Garden Club. So it's something that we really appreciate having on the grounds 
all of our neighbors are telling me we're getting much more yield from our gardens. So we're, we're very help, happy to be helping everybody. We, um, we have 100 acres and we have problems. A lot of you may be familiar with invasive plant species and the problems they're posing around not just here but all over the country. We found about three acres of our, of our grounds over by uh, Duck Farm Road being colonized by Oriental Bittersweet, which is a very invasive non-native plant. And we put together a program to get rid of this. We submitted an application and were approved for a grant from the DEEP, which we worked on all of last year and got rid of the Japanese knotweed and the bittersweet. And now the ecosystem is regenerating itself. The natural plants are coming back. So it's a big, big deal, and it's something that we're happy to share information with on everybody on dealing with this growing, but we think underreported problem. Uh, we also have a lot of trees. When you have 100 acres, you have an awful lot of trees. So we cataloged our trees. We studied them. We brought an arborist on board. We applied for and were granted arboretum status by a very large licensing agency in the Midwest, the Morton Registry of Arboreta. We're one of two registered in the state now, ourselves and Connecticut College. So we're very proud of that. In conjunction with that, we've developed a tree tour, self-guided, which you can pick up uh, a brochure at our office or download it from our website and it's about a half an hour walk through the older sections of the cemetery where you really see memorials to all of the founding members of, of Fairfield and their families. It's a very nice, lovely walk. Finally, and I will end on this, we are very concerned environmentally about reforestation of the natural parks because We've noticed, and you've all read about, how the fires have been destroying, the wildfires are destroying the trees. So for every single person that uh, we later rest at Oaklawn, we plant a tree in a national forest to take part in the reforestation of the parks. And we, last year we did, I think, a little over 200 of these. So those are just some of the things that we're doing. And we're a lot more than just a cemetery. We're creating, we think, a park-like environment. We want all of you to come and experience what we have to offer. We, as the first selectman said, we are just celebrating our 150th anniversary. And we're doing two things to mark that celebration. Number one is we produce this little brochure, which is really a booklet covering what I've been talking about. It's also talking about the other things we're doing like the nature trails and the Boy Scout projects that we have. And I'm going to leave a couple of these back here, so please grab one on your way out. The other thing that we're going to do, and this is why you had to listen to me for the last few minutes, as the price you had to pay, we have made a donation to the town of $5,000. I've met with uh, First Selectman Tetro, members of his staff, Mike Jaley from the History Museum, and Dan Caruso, we are forming a team of people who will go around to the cemeteries, the historic cemeteries, so that you all know where they are on the post road, the old post road up on Greenfield Hill. Uh, and we're going to assess what <coughs> needs to be done there, do a condition assessment of the stones, of some of the uh, bushes and plants. Some of them are kind of ragged. And with the money that we have given to the town, we're going to use that to improve the cemeteries. <clears throat> it is our hope that we'll have an ongoing basis to give more money every year to this fund, because I don't think there is currently a fund that can be used solely for this purpose. So right. that's our little story. We thank you very much for letting us do this. Look forward to going out and uh, checking out the cemeteries and making some real improvements next year. Okay. And before, I thank you very much. Before you go away, I think that uh, it's a bigger deal, I think, than you suggested. Uh, our historic cemeteries are really part of our heritage and part of our history and something that, that we should take care of. Uh, that care has been intermediate, intermittent at best over the years. Uh, Melanie <coughs> Marks was one volunteer who stepped up and did a lot. Paige Herman and, and the Fairfield Beach Residents Association uh, stepped up, and uh, especially after Storm Sandy took care of the uh, 
Beach Road uh, Cemetery, and, and I had a chance to visit with them for the day, and we were finding uh, headstones and gravestones literally buried several inches under the ground and had to bring those up and clean those up. So I think that uh, as we try and promote more of our heritage, as we expand uh, what the Fairfield Museum is doing uh, in terms of helping us out with that, I think this is a key part of that. This is in conjunction uh, with a, another, uh, actually a donation from the Grand Gala uh, proceeds to the Fairfield History Museum to put signage up at each of our se historic cemeteries in town. Uh, so there's some way of explaining what's special about each cemetery. So it uh, gives us a chance to self-educate uh, as we go through and do that. So I want to thank you for your leadership in terms of helping preserve the heritage of our town. I was very impressed because, uh, as you pointed out, we're not all aware of how cemeteries or associations, and especially yours, are active in our town today and adding value beyond the obvious uh, to our town citizens. So I want to thank you for taking a leadership role in that well, and looking you. at the broader community and how to help. And, and we take it very seriously, preserving the history. It's part of our job as we look also to the future and the present and taking care. And we look forward very much to working with you and helping out all we can. Yeah, Lori, did you want to add anything? To that? No, just um, it was like a little uh, very informative for me because I didn't know all of those things were at the cemetery although my dad is buried there. <laughs> yeah, no, we're trying to really um, make it more and more a park-like environment. Yeah. With 100 acres, you can do an awful lot. Yeah. And we have really, really nice topography. I mean, and that's there. great with the yeah. bees. I mean, that's that's a big thing. They've been and, a big uh, hit. Yeah. A big, big hit. Um, Did you want to add and, a few words? Well, I wasn't quite finished. Oh, sorry. That's sorry. okay. Sorry. And I was just going to comment, it's too, I'm, like, I'm glad to hear that, that this is becoming a bit of a priority. As my husband and I have walked by the one on the post road a few times and there's no signage or anything. We were trying to figure out what the, the one back past where divorce used to be. Yep. Yeah. Yes. There's like yeah. nothing that we were like, what, you right. know, what's the name of it? Or it didn't really look like a way to get in there. We're just, uh, so that's. I think a lot of people have the same, uh, same, same issues. Yeah. It was actually, that was a certain cemetery and uh, that kicked off the whole signage issue. Mr. Jan Reber was walking by, had the same thoughts as you okay. did called up and offered to pay for a sign for that so folks would know what it is. Okay. That keyed off the whole signage issue from that standpoint. Yeah, I think it's right. I didn't need to. Bronson, my, uh, my father's been buried there for almost 16 years now. I know we have a family plot there. I'm not eager to be part of that. <laughs> uh, as of now, I have uh, many more years to go, hopefully. And uh, I know, because I've driven through the cemetery many times, that you have a feeling of just a historical um, like you're part of something. You go there and you look at the founding families of Fairfield. They're all there. They're all buried yes, there. Every are. one of them. Sturges, Burr, um, Bronze. Like you yep. look at their giant yeah. monuments and uh, it makes me wish we could do something similar. And I know that you have made that motion by opening up mausoleums. And again, uh, I would love to see uh, the, uh, the days of the giant obelisks coming back uh, to create a humongous monument park uh, in, in the yeah, our, our plans include developing a state lot, which you're referring to, right. where there'll be larger monuments. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be near where actually your father in law uh, has a very nice uh, structure now. Thank you. Mike, I just say two words. Okay, normally we don't, but, but Paige, because of your status within the town, we will certainly <laughs> allow. I would just like to comment. Oh, if you're going to comment, I need to have you come up to the podium, please. Okay. I would just like to compliment uh, uh, the work that's done constantly at Oak Lawn Cemetery. My family's had a, a huge plot there since 1929 when my grandfather passed away. And uh, it is a park. It's a wonderful place to go uh, and to share your memories and your thoughts with families who have passed. But it is, uh, it is a wonderful place and it's quite an attribute to the town of Fairfield. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just in honor of everything that the Oaklawn uh, Cemetery Association has done for the town, uh, we actually have a proclamation that details out many of the things that you just went through. So I will not read it all again, but I will point out that uh, uh, now, therefore, I, Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the town, uh, do hereby proclaim Wednesday, January 6, 2016, as Oaklawn Cemetery Association Day throughout the town. So congratulations. Oh, guys. thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Next up, item number 10, to approve a historic structures management agreement between the Town of Fairfield and the Fairfield Museum and History Center. Um, Mr. Lesser, Jaley, can I have a motion to accept? Make the motion. A second? I'll second it. Okay. It, it's listed on Please. the agenda as being presented by me, but I think it would be, be better if Mike presented it because he's the one who knows what they do. and. He can answer, I think, any questions that you have better than I can about those things. If they're legal questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Mike, um, Good evening, everyone. Mike Jaley, uh, director of the Fairfield Museum. Um, this draft of the Historic Structures Management Agreement before you uh, is an update on a previous um, agreement between then the Fairfield Historical Society and the town. I believe it was 2000 that that was put into place. Um, whereby the Fairfield Museum manages the restoration and the public use and enjoyment of um, historic structures that are here on the town green, notably Burr Mansion, Sun Tavern, Victorian Cottage, and Barn. Um, that previous agreement um, had some vagueness to it, I think, to be generous. Um, and I think with uh, the, the very fortunate recent uh, acquisition uh, of <clears throat> about $800,000 worth of grants that the Fairfield Museum has been able to acquire uh, to restore these properties, we thought it was time probably to just update the language and make sure that it was very clear over uh, the responsibilities between uh, the town and the Fairfield Museum. So what you have before you is an updated uh, draft that we've spent a number of months going back and forth with, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. <coughs> So you've had this kind of, can I ask a question? Please, go ahead. Right. Sure. So this has been in effect since 2000, you said? It has, and there was a, a, a more informal agreement in the 90s around this too. The, the intent was at one time the town <coughs> had a, uh, on the payroll, a town historian who, uh, Bill Lee, who lived in the Sun Tavern and kind of informally did what he could to restore and take care of these properties. <coughs> when um, that arrangement ended, uh, the Fairfield Historical Society and the town came into an agreement whereby we could lend our expertise and our guidance on historic preservation and restoration uh, to uh, hopefully improve and open these properties. That's always been the goal um, for many years. Over the last <clears throat> decade, we've had uh, incremental progress in acquiring funding, working very closely with DPW uh, on restoring these properties. Um, and as I mentioned, we've had final grant funds um, that will be uh, completing the work on Victorian Cottage and Barn and Sun Tavern this summer, and also <clears throat> getting a big chunk of the work uh, that needs to be done to Burr Mansion. Okay. So uh, we're making a big leap forward. We mm -hmm. thought it was time, since that work's going to be uh, requiring us to work very closely with DPW to make sure that this is updated. So you tightened up the language. So what, but what's different? Is there anything added in that wasn't in the previous agreement? Uh, the, the only thing that's really substantively different is the earlier agreement <clears throat> um, called for the museum to do some of the repairs of these properties. Uh, but it really became clear over time that we do not have the staff or really the expertise to sort of do carpentry and things like that. And so the, the, the most substantive change, I think, in this is that it really delineates uh, the role that we will advise and sort of do what we can to guide the work to make sure it meets uh, state and national historic preservation standards. Uh, but the town, DPW, that really has the expertise will be doing the ongoing maintenance as well as capital improvements. One of the great benefits to this agreement, um, as I think evidenced by the uh, grants, is that this really allows um, a wonderful public-private partnership uh, that benefits the town property. So we've been able to go for grants uh, as the museum that benefit these town properties. And as I mentioned, um, 
we've applied this last year to a total, I think it was $795,000 in grant funds that have come to benefit these properties that we applied for. Uh, so it's a, it's a really good balance. It works very, very well. Uh, I think the previous agreement, there was some um, handshake-ness quality to it that I think the first selectman wanted to just make sure was, was properly expressed in this current draft. So okay. that's I, th I think the other thing that drove a lot of this is that uh, we've gone through a long period of what I'm going to call, is deferred maintenance a fair way to say that, Mike? Yeah. Uh, on things like Burr Mansion. And uh, it got to the point that we had to start doing things there. And if the town's going to start investing money in some of that, uh, and a lot of the grants we've gone jointly on to the state to find places to do that. Uh, Mike's been invaluable in terms of tracking some of those down. But as we start to do more of that, and as we envision more of this work in the future, both as once we get Sun Tavern, uh, the Victorian cottages renovated, as we work on the landscape around here, if we can bring more tourism or visitors or guests through here, uh, there's going to be some ongoing maintenance. We want to make sure that that whole process is a little better defined than it was. I think uh, as we went through the old agreement, there were a host of questions that were raised just by lack of definition. So, and just to follow up or sure. continue with that, is so the money, like any money that you get, like rents and stuff from people using places, the money goes to the town or it goes to the so there's, museum? So there's two or sources of income, account. current. <clears throat> um, rental, <coughs> excuse me, rentals at Burr Mansion. Um, and the lease of three sort of office spaces on the third floor of Burbage. Mm -hmm. So those funds currently come to the museum. We turn them back into cleaning, maintenance, tent rentals, most of that. Uh, we do pay ourselves a management fee as part of that, which is in this agreement. Um, and the <coughs> we submit a budget to the town every year at this time uh, on what we anticipate the business will be in the coming year. Um, I will say that um, for the past decade since I've been doing this, <laughs> the net income, <coughs> excuse me, is you know a thousand dollars or maybe two. Uh, you know, we we try to keep it a little bit in the black, um, but much of that is able to happen because the town still carries, <coughs> excuse me, the utilities. And things like that. Okay. <coughs> so they're not they're not profit centers by any means. We do it because. Um, we feel that um, this is an important resource for the town. Yep. Uh, we share a, a desire to have these great resources be enjoyed by the community here and to be uh, destinations for visitation. Yep. So. And how long is the agreement in effect for? <coughs> like if this gets signed? This I believe it's passed, annual, it annual and automatically or? renews, I think. Was that right, what we did? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's annual unless someone, you know, so well, at some point, if things change and we decide yeah, it can we be want to do something yeah. Look, it's, different, it's a paragraph one. It just says it's it's one year. It's uh, in, it remains in effect unless uh, you can give 180 days written notice to terminate it, okay. or 30 days if there's some okay. kind of a material so, default. So it's an easy six out months. clause. Right. Yeah. Right. Either party can do it. Now, any building maintenance or large repairs, do you have to come back in front of the board of selectmen, or you can make the the uh, Historic Society makes the decision on, on whether to proceed or not. Yeah, all the repairs really fall under the DPW's budget. And so what we do every year, and that's, that's sort of delineated in this agreement, is we meet with um, the head of the DPW, Joe, and go over what we think are priority things for them to consider in their budget. And they put the budget together as part of their normal process with the town. And so we're really in an advisory capacity with that. Uh, we, we work with the properties. We know kind of what they need. For um, as far as like scheduling for events, I know it gets crazy here, and it seems like we have something going on every weekend, especially in the summertime. How um, how will the historical society work with the town, um, and I guess I would guess I would say parks and rec to make sure we're just not overloading um, right. events, especially you know in downtown um, in this this area here. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a road race, there's a fair, there's something every weekend, right. and uh, I just want to make sure that. We're working cohesively and we're not overloading and taxing. Um, I think, you know, our, our communication with the town is very good. Obviously, you know, it's our goal to make the Burr Mansion as uh, accessible and used by the community as much as possible. And we work very hard to keep the rental fees are very reasonable, particularly for town mm -hmm. residents, which have their own rate. Um, <clears throat> but we're sensitive to that and we're actually have been working over the last several months with the town 
on a, a draft landscape plan that we'll be presenting at some future meeting um, that hopefully will address some of the traffic and parking concerns uh, around rentals at Burr Mansion. So. Will that landscape plan come through the Board of Selectmen or does that get approved by the I think we'll historical present it. It will come through the Board of Selectmen. Yeah. Right now, it's in the midst of public hearings. So once just, it's yeah, just a, there are some public hearings that have been announced. So you can certainly get an early update on that if you chose to go to one of the, those. Are later in January? I think it's one of the 19th, right? There's one actually. We there was one on the 18th, but we realized that was Columbus it's, Day. So it's the 26th and the 1st of February. Not, not Columbus Day, but you're right. Or, uh, it was a holiday. Yes. Yes. Martin one Luther of those. King. Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King. <laughs> one of those holidays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. All right. Um, Sorry, any further questions? Stop uh, it. No, I will. <laughs> Lori, anything else on your no, side? No, I'm good. Okay. Mike, thank okay. you. Just, I just want to confirm that the town still owns the building. Right. This is literally, for a better term, it's an operating agreement to help with those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, any so my understanding is not really anything different than what we've been no doing. Ownership. It's just this, tightened up. This doesn't change anything. I suggest right. that, that what we're doing here doesn't change the usage or the volume at all. As we look at, at certain other improvements to Burr Mansion, those would have an impact on volume potentially. So right. we want to come back and, and ask some of those questions again. Right. Right. Um, it's a, it's worth noting too that this this arrangement is seen as a model uh, by other communities in the state. So the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation has often pointed to this as a great model for public-private partnership for historic preservation. So. It's really come a long way. Yeah. Uh, any comments from the public? <coughs> All right, back to the board. Any further questions or comments? No. All right, Mike, thank you for all your hard thank work on this. Uh, oh, hold it. May I have, um, we have a motion before us. Um, any further comments before we vote? And Jen, we moved and seconded, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We good to vote? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That was a yes, not a? Yes, I'm not okay. opposed. <laughs> Next up, item 11, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Director of Health. Resolved that Michael C. Tetro, first selectman of the Town of Fairfield, is empowered to execute, authorize, and approve on behalf of the Town of Fairfield any and all contracts or amendments thereof with the State of Connecticut Department of Public Health to conduct activities described in the Personal Service Agreement Log number 2016-1074 with regard to a grant funding period of July 1, 2015 through June 30th, 2017 in the amount of $129,590 to cover the cost to support Fairfield's continued public health emergency preparedness and response, including but not limited to planning for the threats of bioterrorism, pandemic influenza, and emerging infections, infectious diseases such as Ebola. May I have a motion to accept? Move the motion to accept. I'll a second. second. Okay, good. And is there somebody here to present this? Mr. Sands. Good evening, uh, Sands Cleary, Director of Health, Fairfield Health Department. Um, this uh, resolution authorizes uh, the first selectman to sign the contract, this is the 14th year we've been receiving these types of funds. The funds kind of vary from year to year, starting with $25,000 to work on smallpox plan development, um, peaking um, in the middle there, and then now we're down to about $49,000 a year. Um, this supports hiring uh, part-time staff to uh, to fulfill the deliverables of the contract with the State Department of Public Health. Uh, and it all re revolves around public health preparedness. Uh, and examples of this are our work that we did last year with the drive-through point of dispensing at Jennings Beach, where we did, uh, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, dispensed hundreds and hundreds of courses of mock antibiotics uh, from the CDC training bottles that they provided to us. Uh, and we continue to that work. This, this next year will be revolved around two major events, a, um, Another uh, mass dispensing exercise, statewide mass dispensing exercise, where we'll receive a shipment from the state. And another one is what's called the uh, Medical Countermeasures Operational Readiness Review, MCMOR, uh, which will be a, a review of our mass dispensing plans. Um, and so it pays, 
the, the, the staff that we hire does the work necessary to prepare, revise, update our plans, um, and implement what the results of this review would be, but it's all revolved around preparedness. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have. Gus, any? No. So you actually do drills where you hand out? All the time, samples. yeah. Okay. And we're fortunate in the in sense we're a health department that does large-scale flu clinics. So every year we're doing mass dispensing. So we have an edge on a lot of other health departments that don't do not do that. Yeah, I mean, the Jennings Beach operation was, was killer. It, um, they set it up down in Jennings Beach. There were traffic lines coming in and out, cones lining everybody up. They actually enlisted town employees to take breaks at their lunch hour and come down and drive through. So they get some traffic volume coming through that. There were tents set up. Uh, it would have been a great movie set. Uh, we had in terms of folks from works. Greenwich to Meriden driving through our, our pod. When did you do this? This was last May. Okay. Yeah. So uh, excellent job. And, and SANS has traditionally done um, and orchestrated a number of drills in town to make sure we're prepared. Uh, I seem to remember tents set up in, in Town Hall Green and some other places. Yep, so one, one of the things we do is, uh, you know, to test our ability to go anywhere and dispense medications anywhere, anytime, any place. Uh, we had set up a, uh, an inflatable tent right here on Town, town Hall Green uh, and dispensed uh, with, it was set up by Medical Reserve Corps members, uh, volunteers. Uh, it was staffed by uh, staff and Medical Reserve Corps members um, and uh, uh, we essentially did a couple hundred folks within like a two-hour period uh, of, of town employees on this grounds in the public. Uh, and, uh, and then part of the drill is breaking down the tent, folding it up, putting it back in a truck, and getting it out of here and leaving the place just like we found it. Right. And I think part of the reason that um, things operated smoothly during Storm Sandy and the shelter set up at Buffalo School is because of the drills that uh, Sands and the CERT team go through yeah. on a regular basis to make sure that we're always in position uh, so it's not well, five years since the last storm, it's, right. it's a year since the last drill. The, the CERT team does a great job. Of, the CERT team does the overall <coughs> management of the shelter. The medical reserve comes along and the health department comes along to s support the uh, medical aspects of the shelter. Um, but, you know, the CERT team has already done a, a walkthrough of the renovations at Fairfield Ludlow High School to ensure their plans don't change. We're meeting uh, with, the, uh, with the leadership of the CERT team, uh, with, with the consultant that we would hire on this to update the mass, dispense, mass uh, care plans for the town. Um, and so that's all part of this funding is to continually uh, look at where, where do we need to improve uh, our preparedness in terms of our public health preparedness and mass care. Any other questions? No. Um, any comments from the public? Back to the board. Uh, are we ready to vote? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Sands, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, item 12, to hear, consider, and act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Director of Public Works. Whereas, pursuant to CGS section 4-66G, the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development is authorized to extend financial assistance for economic development projects. And whereas, pursuant to approval of the Board of Selectmen and Representative Town Meeting, an application to the state for $100,000 in order to undertake the Fairfield Railroad Station Canopy Project has been filed. And whereas, in order to receive said grant, the town is required to enter into the assistance agreement with the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. Now, therefore, it is resolved by the Board of Selectmen that it is cognizant of conditions and prerequisites for this state financial assistance imposed by CGS Section 4-66G and that the execution of an assistance agreement regarding the aforesaid state financial assistance by the Town of Fairfield in the amount not to exceed $100,000 is hereby approved that Michael C. Tetro, First Selectman, is directed to execute said assistance agreement with the State of Connecticut for state financial assistance and provide such additional information, execute such other documents as may be required, execute any amendments, decisions, and revisions hereto, and act as the authorized representative of the Town of Fairfield in such manner as he shall deem necessary. May I have a motion to accept? I make a motion. A second? I'll second it. Right. And Mr. Hurley, if I could ask you to set this up, the, the, the five-second setup is this project is done. We uh, passed this originally back in, I think, 2012. Yeah. Uh, so this is coming back before us, because, uh, and Mr. Hurley explained that both as a change and also because we need this to get the reimbursement dollars. 
done. So it doesn't have to go through all the boards again, but it does have to come back to this board. Can you fill us in on why that is, Mr. Uh, yeah, um, basically my quick little write-up was a good afternoon, Selectman. I'm Bill Hurley, Fairfield <laughs> Engineering Manager, and on behalf of the Town of Fairfield, we seek the approval for the execution of the assistance agreement uh, provided by the state as part of the reimbursement process for the railroad station uh, canopy steep grant. As Mike alluded to, the project has been completed, and now basically the town is in the process of uh, proceeding with the reimbursement process. Uh, the state um, DECD uh, has uh, um, uh, they su um, supplied the town with the resolution and asked that the uh, Board of Selectmen uh, approve that so we can start the uh, process. But uh, structural, is there something different in this resolution, or did time just run out? on the reimbursement. What's um, the reason this is coming back before us, Bill? Uh, the reason why it's, I'll be honest with you, I, 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 the only reason why I believe it's coming back is that the, the, the state had changed yeah, some of the, the wording from the original resolution and the, uh, the agreement is now 27 pages long, so uh, that should have, I hope that was in the backup, right? You got that or no? No, I don't think we got the 27. Ah, yes, we did. Oh, okay. That's yes, what we did. Thought. So basically, it's just giving you the, the authorization to sign the reimbursement agreement. To me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. The town, uh, we've already spent the money. Uh, we've had great success with the canopy at the uh, railroad station. So now let's get the reimbursement money. And the so it's already started. done. Yeah, it's already okay. done. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering why it was like 2012 and now we're. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a little bit of the history without getting too drawn out. Uh, this was originally part of a steep grant. Uh, it went to a couple different projects. There's some initial things that was talked about. It was finally revamped in doing the canopies at the train station. And that was, frankly, out of. Um, recognition and respect for the commuters where there had been a survey done of our commuters and canopies were like the number one thing they wanted on the stairways moving over. So back in 2012, we ran this through the boards, the steep grant approval, which I think you all have seen before, except in this case it was for $100,000, we said it was for this. Uh, we worked through and got that. Uh, then because it was at the railroad station, it had to go to DOT. DOT bill took a year? Yeah, because um, anytime you work, I'll just use up the number. It might be 25, might be 50 feet from the railroad tracks. And as you know, recent history, unfortunately. But uh, they have um, a special liability insurance program. You have to be trained uh, to work. So whoever the contractor had to do a 10-hour training uh, program because a ladder, a tarp, anything could fly out onto the track and cause all sorts of havoc. Right. And so as part of their road railroad safety program, they make sure everything is in order f for that. So that, that yeah, created a, a year uh, delay. So, well, we also took a while to get the, uh, just the approval from DOT to do it. Right. Because they didn't, you know, that's not a rubber stamp type of event up there in New Britain. Yeah, well, the ori um, in no fairness, the, no the original, uh, way back in 2003, we had looked at doing a metal canopy. Yeah. And that was at a cost of over half a million dollars. So the fact that we were able to use, you know, technology changed, and we were able to use a, more of a fabric type of canopy, a durable uh, canopy, uh, saved the town uh, much money and was eligible for the grant. Uh, while so the other one would have been probably at best a 80-20 or a 50-50. So, right. so essentially the, the project money. cost broke out that $100,000 really covered the canopy installation. There's another $25,000 that I believe DPW kicked in. Well, oh, oh, if, you, yeah, yeah, if you want a quick breakdown of that, I even have the invoices here. Uh, 67 was for the canopy. Uh, uh, 27 was for the brick patio by yep. the uh, bike. By the, um, and the parking authority stand. provided some. Right, right that's right. I was just going to mention that. I've got to give credit to the parking authority. And then the other remainder, uh, was it here? Uh, I think it was 20-something thousand uh, went to um, the uh, re redoing the stair treads. Uh, you know, I've been yep. worn over the years. So um, this is basically just a, for, in my opinion, a formality of just going through so that you can sign the grant so we can, uh, the, uh, um, I got to get the, the wording right. Yeah, the uh, assistance agreement and, and then get the reimbursements. Yes. Uh, any questions from the board? 
I'm good. Uh, I've talked to several commuters who are interested in having a canopy extended over where they're waiting. Um, the, currently, when it rains, the only spot they can receive shelter is underneath the, the Unqua Bridge. Uh, I don't know if that's in the works, but it's definitely something I'd like to uh, maybe hear a proposal on or search for grants in the future, uh, especially on the uh, southbound side for the early morning commuters. Nothing is more miserable than waiting in the rain for the train. Yeah, that's been a as, topic as, of as, discussion mm -hmm. that's been brought up. The issue with that is when you're on the platform, that's 100 percent. Metro North and DOT right, area. It's not say. the town at all. Okay. So it's not a town project. So in order to do that, it's got to be uh, DOT approved and initiated. And DOT has been not willing to discuss that in any great detail until now. Have we reached out to DOT formally and asked them to look into that? Yes. How so? I asked them. Okay. In talking to the commissioner directly. By a letter or just conversation and passing just like a formal request because I'm thinking if the Board of Selectmen were to make a formal request to do so it might carry more weight than a, a conversation or so just thought uh, it would really take you'd really want the parking authority to do that okay all right and they have been also looking into that too so okay. we can go back and follow up but yes that them. has been uh, okay looked at and then the other thing, just um, even just uh, last week, we did for one of our other steep, because uh, always reimbursement, you know, timeline is always a concern. Uh, the town did receive two hundred and fifty-four thousand dollars for our uh, handicap accessibility steep programs uh, at the uh, uh, by the marina here and uh, the, the uh, South Benson Pier, uh, Sasco, and uh, Southport Beach. So we we did get. Especially around the Marina Pier, I've gotten tremendous compliments back from residents on that. Great. That is so much better than it was before and so much easier for uh, seniors and the disabled to be able to access out. And you actually get out onto the water, yeah, or over the water, yeah. It is very successful, so we're proud of that one. All right. Any further questions from here? Yep. Any comments from the public? Uh, back to the board, are we ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Hurley. Aye. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, from the tax collector, to consider an act upon tax refunds as recommended by the tax collector in the amount recommended. I'm have a motion to accept. I'll make the motion. I'll a second. second. All right. Uh, any amendments? Uh, I'd like to make an amendment. Uh, I'd like to make an amendment to remove the period at the end of the sentence and add a comma followed by twelve thousand. Five dollars and twenty-eight cents. Is there a second? Period. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. Uh, all in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 All right. So the motion as amended is before us. Any other amendments or changes? All in favor of the motion as amended? Single by saying aye. 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 Very good. Uh, next up, to hear, consider, and act upon any other business that shall probably come before this board at this meeting. Uh, I, have, I have something real quick. Earlier today we had a legal opinion, uh, which I respect the, the legal authority, but I reread it and I've looked into it, and one of the things which concerns me about it is uh, it says in here to participate in the appointment of members to any board or commission that is political in nature to be appointed. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Timmack, if I might. Yeah. Since that item was already passed, and since you're getting the more detail, what I'd suggest is that you follow up directly with the town attorney. I'd be happy to. Raise that question. Sure. And so that then I suspect this will come back before us again. Um, so that, that uh, though if it comes back in 90 days, it's moved. But I'd directly raise that with the town attorney to get your question answered. Well, I have a question for you, though. Do you believe the police commission is a political body? That we have, uh, according to the town attorney, he ruled that it is. Are all the commissions in town a political body then, or just the police commission? Didn't ask that question, but okay. one could make the argument. Okay. But I would ask the town attorney that question. So today the police commission is a political body according to the town attorney? Correct. Okay. I believe you heard him say that earlier. Okay. Uh, <coughs> with that, is there a motion to No, adjourn? I have a, although there's something else I'd like to just bring yeah. up. Um, and I figured this is a time we could do it. Um, I know, I guess, uh, you know, as I've been meeting people since the, you know, 
everybody's very excited. They're like, how's it going? How's the board? And they're very excited because they feel like we have a board that's well balanced and that that's going to be really good for the town. And I agree it could be. Um, but my concern is that I think we need to, it's like a different kind of challenge that they don't understand our inability to communicate in a timely and efficient manner. So I think that's something that as a board we need to think about how we can do such things. Um, you know, I don't, I just think we need to have a better way to do it. I think we need to come up with it. I think we need to talk about it. Um, you know, I don't think we should, I think we should have ways to communicate what's happening and our feelings and our impressions so that we don't bring people here who then have to sit and maybe be put on the spot. When we had like three different people here tonight that kind of got in that same position and I think that that might be something we want to work to avoid and okay if you have yeah. any thoughts on the process we can certainly discuss those and, and since it's process related we can talk that's about something it. we can talk about okay. as long as it's not a specific Good. person <laughs> or issue yeah because i feel like you know board. like things you know i think we need to try to figure out ways to be able to address things before yes. they come you know yeah. so that we're saving time and being more efficient i would agree it's definitely uh, a little bit of a, a challenge with a three-member board right it's, virtually it's a unique situation every time we talk it's a majority of the board right uh, um, so that creates a uh, foi issue but i think there might be some ways that we can find to work with the rules and so still I'd accomplish what you're asking like to try to do that but why don't sooner we talk rather about than that? later yeah all right, so all right. with that uh i'd entertain a motion to adjourn i'll, I'll do that <laughs> getting worried we've stayed here for a while <laughs> is there a second i'll second it. okay <laughs> thank you all right all in favor no, aye. aye very good thank you and we can talk about the process and administrative matters okay